Welcome. Very good. Hello. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, members of the Vascular Cures uh, community. Um, it's wonderful to have everyone with us here today to discuss, discuss this incredibly uh, important, complex, uh, and evolving topic that is regulatory and reimbursement decision making and with subjective data, specifically uh, patient reported outcomes. So thank you for being here. Uh, I just want to take a couple minutes to set the context for the discussion in terms of uh, vascular cures and, and our mission and what we do. So we have a really rich 35 year history of supporting uh, patient centered research, uh, more recently really uh, focusing on enabling uh, collaborative initiatives that put the patient voice at the center of the conversation. Um, and we're also currently the only national nonprofit exclusively, um, exclusively focused on advocating for the patient voice um, and vascular innovation to ultimately improve outcomes for those patients. How are we doing this? Um, we are incredibly fortunate to have a really diverse uh, network of leaders in vascular health behind our mission, both in terms of the various medical specialties who treat uh, vascular patients, um, and in terms of the many different sectors of healthcare who are enabling uh, new and better treatments. Um, many of you are with us today, and a handful of those fine people are uh, here and are members of our panel. Um, I think what we as an organization are uniquely able to do is bring those diverse groups together uh, with patients to ident identify uh, the highest unmet needs in vascular health um, and generate collaborative solutions that address those needs. Uh, vascular Cures then advances those priority initiatives in the form of research and uh, our internal programs. And you know what is I think additionally unique about, uh, about what we do is the prioritization of the patient perspective throughout the process. Uh, we all know that patient engagement is key to creating solutions that more closely align with what truly matters to patients. Um, so thank you to all of the stakeholder groups for being here um, and for your support of the organization and our mission more broadly. Uh, and I do wanna give a, a very special thank you to uh, all the patients and donors with us today because you are why and how we are able to do this critical work. So thank you. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to our distinguished moderator, Dr. Peter Schneider to introduce the topic for today's conversation. Very good, thank you, Megan. Uh, my honor to um, uh, have been invited to moderate this session. It's a session that's, uh, I think, near and dear to the heart of all of us who care about the treatment of patients with vascular disease. So the discussion today is really meant to be focused on patient-centered outcomes for decision-making and the challenges of using and incorporating this data into clinical research and also therapy development for vascular disease management. So as a clinician for these many years and somebody who's passionate about patient care, so that being um, sort of the basis to which I've often returned for, for answers, you know, I've, I've often worried that whether the patient's needs are being met, whether their concerns are being adequately expressed. So, and I know I'm not the only one, the practice community, the clinical research community, FDA, CMS, other payers, we all have a strong interest in this. So, and I think because um, the patients are why we're here, um, it makes sense to spend a little time thinking about where are we now and where do we want to go with regards to making sure that our treatment plans and that our big ideas align actually with what the patients want. So um, by way of introducing myself, I've been a vascular uh, surgeon for 29 years and I've been strongly interested in education and also in, in furthering um, sort of what we can offer to patients. So with that, what I'd like to do is have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, we'll just um, go from the top of the list here. Dr. Michael Jaff, uh, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks so much for the kind invitation and congratulations to Vascular Cures for putting on this really important topic. I'm a vascular medicine specialist. I've uh, been doing this since uh, the early 1990s. Uh, so I kind of think, my, think of myself as the person who sees patients with all aspects of vascular disease, refers them on for, for uh, appropriate therapy, and then follows them longitudinally to make sure that they're doing well. Um, and just uh, starting this year, I uh, became the chief medical officer and Vice President for Clinical Affairs, Technology, and Innovation for Peripheral Interventions at Boston Scientific. Good for you. Thank you, Michael. 
Uh, Joe Carroll Hyatt. Oh, you're on mute, Joe. There, we hear you. I think we heard you. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Joe Carroll Hyatt. My clinical background is general surgery, and I just wrapped up a, a long career with Kaiser Permanente, where um, I practiced for a number of years. Uh, was the the chief that led the the move to have vascular surgery be separated from general surgery and separated it in my own department first um, and took on administrative roles of going back 20 years now, re really involving uh, looking at evolving technology, new technology, how to strategically deploy it and uh, led the internal technology assessment for Kaiser Permanente for a number of years, as well as all the teams that make the decisions around what products to purchase. Very good, thank you. Yeah, next slide. Great, uh, Dr. Misty Malone. Hi, I'm Misty Malone. I'm the Assistant Director of the Peripheral Interventional Devices Team in CDRH at FDA. Uh, my, my division reviews a number of peripheral devices, including stents, angioplasty, atherectomy, um, various other catheters and whatnot. And so we've been involved with reviewing um, a lot of the recent devices and watching them grow from beginning to end. And we also have opportunities to partner with patients in a number of different ways through patient engagement, outreach, and patient-reported outcomes and patient surveys. So thanks. Great, thank you, Misty. Um, so I have to apologize, I didn't have the slides up right at the beginning, and I was wondering if Donna, if you could please introduce yourself. Sure, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm Donna Buckley, I'm a clinical reviewer with FDA, and I work primarily with endovascular devices um, at the stages of clinical study and marketing review. Uh, I'm an interventional radiologist by training, and uh, I'll do, also do a little bit of clinical work at uh, Georgetown University. University Hospital. Terrific, thank you. Um, Dr. Retti? Hi, so I am a physician with Optum Care, which is Optum's direct care delivery organization that uh, delivers care to mostly full risk members, um, mostly in Medicare Advantage, but also uh, uh, commercial and, and Medicaid risk, which involves a lot of care to children, particularly in the West Coast. And I am deriving a program within Optum that's focused on evidence-based medicine and reducing low-value care. So I think I bring the uh, token payer and uh, risk-based provider perspective to this conversation and really looking forward to talking about this with all of you. Very good. Thank you so much. All right. So we'd like to get in now to uh, some questions that hopefully will stimulate some interesting discussion. And the first one that we wanted to look at is this um, concept of the current state of patient-centered data in the vascular field with respect to regulatory and reimbursement considerations. And when the second question here or this companion, how does this compare to other disease states? You know, we're hoping or imagining that we may be able to learn something about uh, how patient-centered outcomes are included and patients' opinions are heard maybe in other fields like cancer or heart disease, et cetera. So I'm wondering, um, Dr. Jaff, do you think there, that, is there a field within medicine that has sort of a gold standard for patient-centered outcomes that you know of? I don't know if I'd say it's a gold standard, but certainly ahead of us would be orthopedic surgery, particularly uh, arthroplasty, knee or hip arthroplasty. And some of that's driven, Peter, I think, because of the fact that they're way far ahead when it comes to value-based healthcare. Uh, as you know, uh, the BPO has been around now for several years. Many major metropolitan areas participate in this. Um, so physicians and health systems and hospitals have had to learn how to be successful in an episode of care. And some of that's related to what the patient wants and how the patient feels. So I think compared to us, even though ironically, many of the people who come with complaints of orthopedic issues have very similar and often mystifyingly confusing symptoms to the vascular specialist, right? Their leg bothers them when they walk. And yet 
I think orthopedics is far ahead of where we are. Yeah, no, that, that's uh, interesting. And uh, anybody else have any thoughts on uh, other fields that we should be looking to outside of vascular besides orthopedic? So Peter is Joe Carroll. I think that uh, part of the reason ortho has kind of jumped ahead is that they recognized some time ago that setting expectations pre-op is really, really important. And I think vascular has a bit of the same challenge of really trying to understand what the patient is trying to uh, ultimately achieve in their recovery, what level of function, et cetera. So I think those are similar. I think oncology may be another to, to think about that way because of the really significant role of shared decision-making around the trade-offs in aggressive therapy and the debilitation that may come with that versus supposedly measurable longer life. Is it really worth it? So I think anything that really impacts quality of life is probably the best place to look. Yeah, makes sense. And um, I'm wondering, um, Dr. Buckley, as a practicing physician and somebody who's seen so many of the uh, regulatory, uh, the studies that are essentially conducted for regulatory approval as they're coming through. How, do, how does the FDA look at the, let's just say the patient-centered outcomes within vascular? Um, what's the level of importance? Where do you think we ought to take it? Um, we're going to hear more from FDA later in the hour about how you solicit directly some patient-related outcomes, but this to me sounds like a, a fantastic uh, idea. What do you think? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I can talk a little bit about where we are currently with um, how we look at um, some of the patient-centered data with current clinical trials. Right now, um, when we look at health-related quality of life, for example, um, all studies capture relatively simple measures like EQ5D, some only um, some use a handful of the longer measures such as the SF36. When we look at vascular specific quality of life measures, um, we're starting to be a little bit better about incorporating those measures in regulatory studies, thinking about things like vascuqual, um, and then questions are currently coming up about how to operationalize that. For example, is the VQ6 adequate and um, do we need to modify things for CLI specific measures? When we look at other measures beyond um, kind of the quality of life inventories, um, we're also thinking about um, things that give us insight into functional status uh, and uh, the walking impairment questionnaire is kind of a standard, easy um, measure that's included in every trial, but it doesn't obviously tell the whole story with regard to frailty and some of the other, other issues. But to get at issues that directly relate to patient preference, uh, meaning what patients choose when presented with different options, that has not been routinely uh, a routinely captured data element, but it's something that we're, we're interested in looking at. So as a collective, this is currently considered for the most part in prospective PAD studies as supplemental secondary information. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and what about the payers, uh, uh, Dr. Reddy? What, what, how do the payers look at this in terms of patient-centered data? Yeah, well, it certainly helps uh, fill out the picture of, uh, of patient outcomes and potentially in some cases will change the way we think about the relative value of, of certain therapeutics. Yeah, I think the key is being able to be, be reliable in your measurement and also to be able to validate what, what we see in, in our own population. So measurement in the, in, a, in the wild, so to speak, is really important. We've seen a lot of examples where, you know, under very controlled trial circumstances, you see particular impacts that just don't seem to translate when you, you start doing this more generally. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you one example. We have, so we're, we're using a, a general um, uh, pain and functional status assessment in orthopedics 
to help us do shared decision making with patients and help them determine whether they're uh, uh, wh whether they're going to get the kind of benefit they want with physical therapy or conservative management versus surgery, and and, and try to give them quantitative information as they make that call. Um, what we're finding is that we can reduce the, in this case, we were looking at spine pain and spinal fusions. We can reduce the, the rates that people choose surgery by about 30 or 40% and really get equivalent outcomes at the end of the day in terms of the type of improvement we expect to see. And, um, you know, what's powerful about that is because you're measuring on the front end, you're measuring on the back end, you can see whether your, your surgical groups and your uh, physical therapy groups are, are actually delivering on what we would consider a standard of, of care results. Yeah, that makes a lot of good sense. For um, Dr. Hyatt, you've had a lot of experience in the Kaiser system. Have you noticed any, anything, do you have anything to add to, to what Dr. Reddy was, was uh, mentioning? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's interesting uh, using the spine example. Uh, there are technologies that allegedly can improve the accuracy of the um, uh, target for uh, disc surgery and uh, being able, there's a MRI technology, MRI, it uses MRI and then some other sophisticated software and spectroscopy to, um, to determine where the pain is coming from. And what gets tricky, and I think it applies in vascular surgery as well, is when you throw into the mix the, uh, the differences in patient uh, interest in aggressive invasive therapy and the uh, surgeon's interest in providing it, which may be financially motivated and it may be because all of us went into surgery, those of us that are surgeons, because we like to be in the operating room. And uh, that's certainly a factor. Uh, so those things complicate what, and I appreciate Michael's comment about having a, a measurement that's reliable and consistent, but it's not so easy to, to get uh, reliability when you have these confounding variables. Yeah, interesting. And I'm wondering for uh, Dr. Malone, you've seen, you've probably over these past five years had a crash course in uh, device applications, I'm gonna guess. Uh, um, just the, the current pace of advancement of technologies in the vascular space, I think is, is dramatically increased, hopefully to the patient's benefit. Um, it'd be nice if we could prove that, but I'm wondering if you, you know, do you have a, can you, when you're going, through an application, is there anything in particular that really, if that that really stands out for you in terms of a sort of a patient-related real-world outcome? And uh, Dr. Buckley already mentioned the EQ5D and SF36. There's and the VASCUQAL. There's also CDTLR, and a CDTLR is part of every study. Um, we can have specific criteria for what is a CDTLR and what isn't. It's certain, certainly an important part of the patient's experience because they have to have recurrent lower extremity symptoms in order to qualify. So among those or any others that you can think of, or is there an example of one that you particularly think is a useful one uh, going forward? So I think I, I missed part of that when you, um, uh, with the connection, but uh, were, there, were you asking about particular uh, quality of life measures or particular, particular endpoints that need to be important to the patient? Well, I'm, I was thinking in terms of a patient-centered outcome, and we have some that yeah. are now routinely, I mean, you're going to get delivered a package next week, the week after, the week after, it's going to have certain things in it. Does it have in it the things that you rely on, that you feel like you can trust? Mm -hmm. Is there any one or a, a couple of those in particular, or do you feel like we're still wanting for more information? How do you feel about it? I mean, it's just <laughs> like, it's like putting smoke in a box. It's an ambiguous thing. Patients are so heterogeneous. They come in all shapes and sizes. And, we, and yet we're trying to pick something that's going to help streamline this thing. So we know, are we making progress? Are we doing good? And so what, how do you view it? 
So we recognize the value of many of these patient-centered measures. However, um, some of them either are, like you said, CDTLR, which may be subjective on whether the doctor chooses or not to treat the patient or not to treat the patient based on what they're seeing in the totality um, of the patient's um, characteristics or how they're feeling or their lifestyle. So there's more that factors into these decisions that we can't always capture in numbers. And so we recognize that and are interested in identifying outcomes that are important to the patient, as Donna um, mentioned. So it's, it's, more, it's easier for me to look at the CLI patient population when, from a regulatory standpoint, we're interested in what is the device doing. It's typically, if it's an angioplasty uh, balloon, it's opening up the vessels. So therefore, we're interested in patency. But that endpoint may not be the most valuable to patients. They're interested in, are their wounds healing? Are they keeping their leg? Can they continue to walk? And so when we see studies, we think about these endpoints. However, um, there's not a standardized wound measurement um, out there. So we are doing two things. We capture those as additional secondary endpoints so that we can make a regulatory decision, but we're also collaborating with multiple groups to identify additional patient reported outcome measures or um, help to standardize uh, some of these endpoints so that way we then can make decisions on the outcomes that are very important to patients. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Dr. Michael Jaff, do you have, I mean, You've probably authored several hundred uh, clinical studies in your uh, career, um, and probably each one of those had some consideration of patient-related outcomes. What do you think about this issue? Are, are we still wanting for a number of additional ways of assessment? What do you think? I, I think we are. I still think we have a way to go, Peter. So if we think exactly the way Dr. Malone and Dr. Buckley were talking about what matters to the patient, you and I would think differently about what you would say to a claudicant as opposed to someone with critical limb ischemia. And so, for example, in claudication, it's just hard for me to understand how we can do a clinical trial and not include some objective assessment of walking distance. After all, that's what the patient came to you that they can't do that they want to be able to do, either for their job, for their retirement, for their hobbies, whatever it is, they want to be able to walk farther. And if we do a procedure that gives a pristine artery, great runoff, the foot looks great, but the patient says, I'm not walking any better, we might feel great, but the patient's completely dissatisfied. So I think we have a long way to go still to get to an endpoint that really matters for our patients. Yeah, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, my arteriogram looks great. That's Except right. for maybe a vascular, <laughs> a vascular specialist. That's right. But, I'm wondering if we could, um, uh, Megan, bring us to the next slide and the next issue that we wanted to cover. So what is the value of patient reported information to each stakeholder group? Now we already uh, talked about a little bit about how the vascular specialist feels, um, but what about the other stakeholders? We've got payors, we've got the clinical research community, we've got uh, practitioners, regulatory, et cetera. No, Alejandro, do you want to take a crack at that? You've already alluded to it a little bit about the value of these uh, uh, sort of patient reported information bits and what that means for the stakeholder. In your case, the payer, what do you think? Well, it really helps us uh, develop a more well-rounded perspective on the quality, the value of the care that we're we're purchasing essentially on on behalf of the people who are uh, the patients or the, the the employers who are paying them. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. There, it can have a lot of interesting effects on how how we think about doing doing that business. So we talked about orthopedics, right? At the end of the day, we want get get people back on their feet. We want them walking, and we want them feeling like they can live uh, their daily lives the way they want to be living them. Um, and it, w I think it was Dr. Jaff was talking about um, uh, bundling, which has really been advanced for some time in orthopedics. Um, another thing that pay, uh, patients have really liked about that um, 
that method of purchasing has been the coordination it brings to, to surgical episodes. So patient's care is a lot better coordinated now um, around some of these episodes than it was before, um, particularly when you think about inpatient to post-acute to, to home type rehab. And patients, patients love that and respond to that because their, their experience is strong and they, they feel like they're being carried through the entire experience till they get to the, the end and they actually have the outcome that they want. Yeah. So, um, yes, I, I, that sounds really reasonable. So, so Michael Jaff, put on your clinician's hat for just a minute and think through, you know, how many uh, patients you've seen and tell us about a kind of a situation where that one-to-one -one relationship between the physician and the patient results in you having a very clear understanding of what the patient's desires are. Well, if I could pick a different vascular syndrome, I'll give you a story, Peter, and you'll remember this because I asked your advice years ago. When I was at Mass General, we used a, uh, a really cool software program called Cupid, which was natural language processing for electronic medical records. And we built a real-time tool that allowed us to use patient-reported outcomes for patients who had carotid stenosis. And there had to be a decision about what therapy for carotid disease would that patient prefer. And then if, based on their choice, what their risk was based on the outcome, their risk of having a stroke or dying. And the process was incredible. The problem was it added time. We had built this model so that any clinician who was going to book a case, that is either a carotid stent or a carotid endarterectomy, had to complete this before they could actually book the case. And even though the process took about 10 minutes to do at the end of your clinical consultation, that was 10 minutes too long. And it was really tough, Peter, because uh, most of us, when we're physicians, we're trained to be the ones to know what we think patients need the most, right? That's the hurdle that we as, as uh, leaders have to get over the goal line is the patients really can understand what their issues are what the options are, and what works best for them. And the part that historically physicians don't really see into enough is what that patient's home environment is, what's their social fabric where they live, what's their economic situation, can they afford to be out of work for a period of time, uh, will they get paid if they're out of work, how will they pay for prescriptions if they need expensive post-procedure medications. These are real issues that historically we've not been trained to ask. And if we don't ask patients, we probably won't get that insight. So I think that's a great example of how understanding how to ask patients what really matters to them and using that with them to decide, that's kind of the perfect one-on-one -on -one environment. Well, and, and it's interesting that the sense was that even though you had a useful tool that would sort of bring the patient closer in, it was felt like the, the time was just too much. And just to add to your list of concerns, um, I'll just throw out something that I think is a little bit possibly heretical at this point. But honestly, I, I think the electronic medical record, even though it's made the data gathering much better and m easier to track over a period of time, has made the individual patient visit, I think, more challenging. Uh, this is my own personal opinion, uh, that face-to-face -face time now is got a computer in between the two faces. So um, I, I think sometimes it's in, that's an inhibiting effect, I think, for patients. This is my personal opinion. I don't know. Alejandro, in your clinical work, do you feel like that's an issue or not really? I think it's definitely challenging. And we're, we're, we're doing things to try and make it better. You know, for example, to use use smart prompts in the EHR to provide good information, quantitative information about relative risks to drive a more high quality shared decision making conversation. But to your point, there's there's less time in the visit than there was 10 years ago. And you know these things, these kind of conversations take time. Yeah. Agreed. And uh, l let me uh, turn the conversation to uh, Dr. Hyatt uh, once again, where you, you know, you have this uh, experience, this rich experience in Kaiser, which has been, in my opinion, a leader in value-based care. So where does Kaiser put the value of the patient experience 
in the equation? How does that influence things in your experience? So it's an interesting question, Peter. The uh, second largest account for membership in the organization is actually the physician staff and dependents of ourselves. And the decisions that are made are those that we're making and how we want to be cared for ourselves and our family members. So it, it, it's personal. Um, the uh, patient perspective comes in in many ways. I, I think that I don't have a great example in, in vascular, uh, since I'm not a vascular surgeon, but I can tell you that the decisions around uh, the care paths, the products that are selected, equipment, uh, increasingly the perspective of the members, of the patients, and in fact caregivers in some circumstances has been brought into the room for those decisions. And uh, it's been extraordinary valu extraordinarily valuable. I think it, it's really critical. Going back to really tracking uh, metrics and measurable outcomes, again, it's most advanced in the orthopedic space in Kaiser Permanente with the orthopedic implant registry now well over 20 years old with a lot of mature data. Uh, and those metrics have in fact driven uh, a number of decisions. There was a technique a few years ago with uh, uh, using uh, uh, cement versus uncemented knee replacement and tracking those clinical outcomes and the patient reported outcomes in terms of their recovery and pain level and uh, their satisfaction led the organization to publish that information back to all the orthopedic surgeons that were using the technique without cement because those, that population was not doing as well. It looked great initially, but the longer term outcomes were not at the same level. And so that kind of information is extraordinarily valuable. I do wanna quibble with what was said about uh, the electronic medical record being a wonderful platform for being able to pull data it's not, uh, Ep and those of us that are on EPIC know this, um, EPIC was designed to manage the records of a small pediatric practice in Madison, Wisconsin. That's what it was built for. And it was never intended to be a major research tool at the beginning. And they've struggled for decades now trying to improve things. Um, Kaiser Permanente has had to build a ton of additional tools to try and mine the information in the record. But as long as the world has dictation, free text, any variant away from the templates or drop down smart phrases, whatever are used, uh, it's gonna continue to be really difficult, even with natural language processing, which has helped a lot. Do you think, uh, Joe Carroll, do you think that the the electronic medical record could be optimized to the point where it could, instead of taking away from the time with the patient, could now start to give back at some point. It, because uh, Alejandro mentioned the same thing that you, there are some I don't you can call them workarounds, but they're really solutions to try to make it more effective and uh, and and try to you know ultimately if it could possibly give back some time to the doctor patient or provider patient discussion, that, that would really enhance this whole idea of really trying to understand what the patient wants out of all of this. What do you think? Well, I think there are opportunities, but all of them require a lot of investment. And they, uh, especially now in the world we're in where everybody is so focused on trying to survive in many ways, uh, I don't think that those marginal benefits of bringing in slicker tools for either the clinicians or the patients are going to be supported financially for mm. a while. Um, I think there is an opportunity. There's, uh, there are technology solutions that can help a lot. Um, you can envision various sensors that would feed data that the Patients wouldn't even have to directly report uh, themselves that would just automatically know when they took pain medication or how far they walked, how many steps, uh, various other parameters that they wouldn't even have to enter themselves. 
in theory, all of that today is technically possible, but it's not free. But it's not supported. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I think I've had two migraines in my life, and one of them was the day we started the electronic medical record in my clinic. Uh, that's neither here nor there. So let's go back to Dr. Buckley. You're a practicing physician. You're having these conversations with patients. You're doing complicated things when they need it. And then you're going a few miles away to your regulatory hat, where then now you're seeing large groups of these uh, information uh, pieces gathered and presented. You know, of course, we're trying to present them in a streamlined way. But what's, what's your inner feeling about all this stuff? Is it just two completely different worlds, the conversations we're having with patients? And then where, when it eventually comes to regulatory, what, what do you think? It, it is a challenge. Um, you know, as a regulatory and a regulatory agency, the FDA is specifically designed as a patient-focused organization. Um, and to that end, you know, we're interested in any and all data that would provide insight into how a new technology can make a patient's uh, life better. To that end, it can be really challenging to operationalize anecdotal data to support regulatory decision making, especially in the um, era of a least burdensome approach where you're at serving as a regulator trying to link a specific clinical outcome with, with the unique uh, device that, that, that's um, being evaluated for study and, and potential regulatory approval, which is exceedingly challenging in this, this patient population given the, the influence of, of all sorts of uh, covariates. So, um, you know, as a clinician, I, I certainly see the value of anecdotal data. It's helpful um, in the early flagging of technologies and techniques with real potential. Um, and on the other end, um, anecdotal data is important to flag those events or experiences that I guess, quote, everybody knows, but that that information hasn't made its way into the literature um, that has the, the utility that a regulator would would need. Um, so in that way, so far, we've really been looking at it as a supplemental inf um, source of information. But our hope is to, to obviously continue to develop patient-centered data so that we can operationalize it in a, in a meaningful uh, way to support regulatory decision making. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And let me turn now to uh, Dr. Malone. What, what do you think, um, can, can you give us a sense of what interpretable and usable means in terms of, you know, not to get, you know, too crazy in terms of uh, specific wording, but when, what does that mean to you? So interpretable is data that um, we have enough information to make sense of it. So, uh, if you were given data on a few patients and there's uh, much, a lot of missing data, there may be challenges with interpreting it. However, if you have enough data, uh, sufficient data with minimal mi missingness, minimal variability, that's very easy to interpret. So whenever we say interpretability, that's what we're typically looking at. And when it's meaningful, is it clinically meaningful to the clinician and the patient? Um, so our value for patient reported information really relies or it, it helps to support the um, or provide perspective and color around the benefit and risk that tolerance for the patient. So patients in extreme pain may be willing to tolerate greater risk to receive benefit from the pain. However, patients with um, some other diseases may be unwilling to tolerate that risk. When we make our decisions, we're not making decisions based on absolutes, absolute benefit or absolute risk. It's a balance. And that balance is based on what the patient and the clinicians are uh, willing to accept, where their tolerance is. And that helps to define that benefit risk. We really couldn't make a decision regarding um, risk tolerance without understanding what the patient uh, desires. Well, that is a really, really great answer. Um, and, and that goes three layers deep. I, I really like that. Um, and I think let's, why don't we proceed to the last question that we had in mind. Um, 
and let's see. Uh, so the last question that we really wanted to discuss is how can we get a better understanding of what patients consider to be important? And looking forward, how can we collect robust patient reported data that can better enable decision making? So this is really kind of where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, of, okay, we know this is a challenge. What are some of the things that we could do about it going forward? And I was really intrigued, as I think everyone was, when we heard uh, Dr. Malone and Dr. Buckley were, some few weeks ago, were describing the, the program that you use at the FDA to try to get a better understanding of the patient experience. And I was wondering if if the two of you could chime in a little bit and give us an idea, maybe this should be done more broadly was the feeling I came away with after hearing your description. Can, can you tell the group about it a little bit? Sure, I can, I can start off and Donna, if you'd like to add anything else, feel free to. So we have the patient science and engagement team at CDRH at FDA. Uh, this team is directed by uh, Dr. Michelle Tarver, who is fantastic and extremely knowledgeable in this area. And over the past several years, she has promoted patient engagement, um, which allows us to interact with patients, to um, have meaningful interactions, to understand their perspectives, and they can provide insight on the expectations for clinical trial design or endpoints, outcomes, what is meaningful to them. So we, my group has met with several patients with CLI. As I mentioned, it's a complex disease. It's complex to study. And it's, it's fascinating to listen what is interesting to them, what endpoints um, are most meaningful, and how it impacts their life. We've also met with groups who are evaluating um, and coming up with new PRO measures. So there's uh, the promise, um, uh, the groups developing the promise measures and others so we can learn what considerations they, um, they undertake whenever they make these, these uh, surveys. And they also provide consults to us for patient surveys or patient preference surveys to make them, um, because some of our trials, it may be challenging for us to interpret the results. As we mentioned, the interpretability of the results. And so when a company may be able to do a patient preference survey, that will provide that perspective for us then to help us better understand their marketing application. So this group is extremely valuable. They provide insight on how to review this data how to incorporate this data, and then they're also collaborating with external experts to improve the ecosystem because as several of you noted, there is a, an improvement that needs to made, be made here. Donna, did you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think you summarized it well, Misty. I think we're just trying to get our arms around what's a better way to really approach this. I mean, to Michael's initial point about, you know, walking distance is meaningful for patients and how to link something like that to an imaging outcome where we're able to, from a regulatory agency to really isolate the impact of the device and it looks you know, nice on paper and it's objective, but how do we really operationalize that so we can, when we talk about the totality of the data, we're able to really look at it in a way where we can, can make it uh, usable and, and meaningful to patients. Very good. Well, I was excited about uh, learning about this program and I'm sure many people on the, on the call are also uh, interested in hearing and learning more. I'm wondering if I could turn to, to Dr. Jaff once again. Um, Michael, you've worn different hats during your career and part of your responsibility now is within industry. Uh, obviously, you want to. You're you're in a working for a, a group that wants to make safe devices, that wants to make what the patients need, et cetera. Is there anything that you've heard about going on either anywhere in industry where the sort of the patient-centered outcomes are starting to to rise to the top in importance? And you're on mute. Sorry about that. Probably the most common three words we're all saying nowadays, right? You're on, that's four words. You're on. Um, 
Listen, uh, it's been really interesting to watch the evolution in thought that happened long before I came to industry, but uh, there are a couple of signals that really bring me a lot of excitement about how this is becoming uh, more important. One is that it's discussed now regularly at clinical trial strategy meetings. So rather than being a an also ran kind of last thought after things are about to be submitted, uh, we're discussing very early on how to get the voice of the patient. And not only not only in that kind of a generic of phrase, Peter, but we're trying to answer questions that relate to patients that are not routinely included in clinical trials, but suffer from the same illnesses. And in fact, in many situations have worse outcomes because they're either not identified as early, they're not treated as appropriately, their comorbid medical conditions aren't identified and raised. So, so that's one thing that's very exciting. The other thing that, that I actually didn't know that happened in the industry that happens quite often are uh, patient task forces where actually groups within companies are meeting regularly with patients to say, either we're thinking about this or we've got this uh, therapy. Uh, what do you, if we explain it to you, and, and in fact, if you have the condition, what matters to you about this story? What questions would you wanna ask before this actually was presented to you as a physician? And so the fact that, that that's happening takes me back to my days as a hospital president when we also had patient advisory councils um, and, and we call them PFACs or patient family advisory councils where people who were patients of our hospital or physicians, family members, or actually just patients that had never been to our hospital uh, spend time once a quarter uh, helping us understand the toils of navigating a complex healthcare system, understanding how to make choices, helping physicians learn what questions to ask. So I'm, I'm actually pretty bullish about how this has now become more of the regular lingo within industry. Yeah, very interesting. It sounds almost like the the patient experience working group within the within the FDA. Maybe some slightly different angle on it, but it's uh, it goes back to the same place. And yeah, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Reddy, for within the payor community, uh, how is that viewed in terms of? Um, you know, in terms of, of what rises to the top, what is considered important? Um, do you have any ideas about what we all should be looking at going forward in terms of uh, understanding the patient's needs and desires? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think my answer is gonna be any different than the answer from, from a provider perspective. We wanna be looking at the things that, that matter to our patients. And interestingly, we about 18 months ago, purchased a company called Patients Like Me. And um, I've had the privilege of working with those folks a little bit to, to better understand what they've learned about what, what patients care about. So this is a website that maintains communities of patients across different disease states, and they give each other support. They help each other find clinical trials. They talk about the best way to manage their condition. And one of the really cool things they've done is tracked um, people track how they do over time and they can put information about what treatments they've started and, and, and how they responded to them. And, and, um, uh, you know, in a, so it's kind of like a, a focus group on steroids longitudinally kind of sitting online. And I think one of the, one of the coolest things is just that it gives you ideas about questions to ask that you didn't think were important to patients with suffering from that particular condition. Um, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot to learn here, but there, there are some really cool things we can do to, to, um, to, to bring that, bring that kind of data into, into the work that we do every day. That sounds really uh, exciting because it, it really opens up the whole concept or direction of using new technologies to assist us in this area. So this patients like me, uh, concept, I think, is one that, uh, to me, that sounds really exciting. Because in a sense, the patients may even be soliciting these uh, responses from each other, as opposed to uh, sitting someone down and, 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 uh, and, and a physician or other healthcare provider asking specific questions. In a sense, they're, they're telling you what's important to them spontaneously. Is that is that some of what you're getting out of patients like me? 
Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, the the groups themselves decide on what it is that they want to track, and they have sort of an internal governance process where where uh, where the patients can structure their group website and tracking a little bit differently. But but absolutely, you know, I mean, the number of conditions where patients cite fatigue is one of the top three clinical issues that they want to deal with and think conditions that you would never think fatigue is, you know, kind of a top, top list item. Um, you know, it tells you, God, there's really, we perhaps need to be thinking about an issue like that more in, in some of the conditions that we manage. Yeah. Well, I, d- I do believe um, from my own point of view, uh, as been mentioned earlier in the hour, uh, Misty mentioned uh, critical limb patients or CLTI, I, I really believe that they, they do reach a fatigue point because there is no one thing. There, there are so many factors, and, and Dr. Buckley mentioned this, there's so many factors that get a patient into a condition of CLTI. No one thing is going to fix it. And so they do become fatigued, whether it's because they need multiple vascular procedures or mo- multiple local procedures, or they haven't literally been able to walk. I'm all upset because I'm tired of sheltering in place and being in quarantine and et cetera, et cetera. Well, these folks, they've walked their whole lives and now they can't walk because we're telling them it's too dangerous to walk because they have to offload their, their foot. It's got to be in, incredibly uh, uh, upsetting for them. And, and I think fatigue is probably, probably part of it. As Misty said, there, we don't really have a standardized way of assessing wound care and wound management and what it means. We know when it's healed, but that's, oh my gosh, what a process it is to get those, those things healed. And I will say, um, just as by way of reminder, that Vascular Cures is going to put on an innovation summit in September. I know you all know about it, but just for the audience. And in that, we're going to talk about uh, patient-centered uh, outcomes and how they can be enhanced by new technologies. And uh, it's, a, it's a long enough segment that we'll be able to dive into some of the specifics of different vascular conditions like intermittent claudication and possibly tracking claudication using your, your iPhone or your, you know, the computer in your pocket or, um, or specific uh, things related to CLTI um, and, and what are the concerns there and how that could be enhanced by electronic tracking, whether you're looking at uh, photos of wounds over a period of time or, or what, what have you, uh, different types of technology. So I just wanted to remind the whole group of that um, as we're getting in our last few minutes here. I was wondering if we could just kind of do a round table and maybe each of us um, just say uh, some, maybe if you have an idea about how we might approach patient-centered outcomes going forward. Um, a lot of ideas have come up in this hour, maybe even bring up the one that you thought was best or that, that uh, uh, there's going to be, uh, of course, we're recording this, but, but as a summation of this, we'll be um, accumulating all these ideas and looking to see are there uh, groups, study groups, grants, et cetera, that, that may be uh, sought to go after one or another of these ideas. So why don't we just um, run the list one more time, uh, Dr. Buckley, um, since, um, since, since you're, you're first, um, tell us, what, what, what do you think? Anything catch your ear over this past hour? Yeah, no, I, 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 I wish I had a silver bullet um, in, in terms of um, really what is the best place to start first. As a regulator, I would say probably the easiest place for us to continue to work on is at least um, insisting and or um, making sure we have uniform collection of those data in any uh, regulatory submission or um, um, trial that comes along so that we are capturing that information. We have been, but I think we can uh, continue to do better um, and at least uh, we can do that, that piece as we continue to develop um, how to look at this as a, as a community. Very good. Dr. Hyatt? What do you think? I think uh, building on that a little bit, there may be an opportunity to access some of the existing patient input uh, fora, whether it's the one at Optum or FDA or both, 
uh, and the professional societies and perhaps build a template of potential questions that would be relevant across the, the spectrum of vascular conditions. And then for each uh, technology that comes along to use that same template, identify the questions on it that are most relevant and have everybody include that standard in the clinical trials, in the clinical care ongoing with some mechanism to gather it. And as you said, the computer in your pocket is probably the best tool. You run into mm -hmm. cybersecurity, privacy, all kinds of other questions, but hopefully that would be feasible. Very good, Dr. Jaff. You know, Peter, I, I think first of all, back to the uh, comment about uh, fatigue, any chronic illness uh, is often overlaid by some form of mental illness, either depression, anxiety. And, you know, if we don't ask our patients why they want their claudication improved, we'll never get to the fact that some of them are embarrassed that they can't keep up with their friends. Uh, they can't go out and play golf with their buddies. They can't go out to dinner with their significant other because they just can't keep up and it's embarrassing. So they basically stop going and then they feel like they're kind of restricted, they get depressed, that leads to fatigue and, and uh, weight gain and weight loss and all that stuff. So again, I think it's important that we know how to ask these questions of patients. And perhaps um, uh, one way to get this moving a little faster, Peter, would be if, if uh, outcomes registries that were used to document for reimbursement would put more weight on patient reported outcomes and the results of those, uh, that might, in fact, move the medical community a bit faster since that's uh, kind of the basic fact of life. Um, if, if we do a better job in patient-reported outcomes that truly matter uh, to the patients, that might reflect positively on compensation. That, that'd be something that could move things along. Very good. Good. Excellent point. Uh, Dr. Reddy, anything to add? Yeah, well, building on these these comments, I think these are great ideas. I think payers are willing willing to 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 consider that if we can actually collect it. So, I, providing a some standardized and well vetted questions to ask that are clinically usable in a clinical setting, right? So we're talking short, not not really long inventories, would be profoundly helpful because you know those of us on the front lines, we, we can figure out how to get a patient to do it and how to get it to the patient. But what we're less good at is actually picking the best questions and, and making sure that's going to be comparable ultimately to what everyone else is doing, which is really what we want to do. So I, I think that's a fantastic idea. Well, these, these are really, really insightful comments and, and thoughts. And uh, I know Dr. Malone, anything to add? Sure. I'm, I'm both excited about uh, the patient-centric measures that, that we may be able to use eventually. I mean, Dr. Hyatt mentioned earlier um, how many of us are wearing a Fitbit or a Garmin or an iWatch that um, will, it's capturing information that may be usable. How can we use this to look at um, outcomes directly from patients and also from other device-related uh, outcomes? Um, but I'm also interested in that we move forward with these PROs, how can we, uh, or quality of life measures, how can we validate these? So can we uh, validate the VQ25, the vacuum call uh, 25 or 6 um, against outcomes in, in patients? How do we validate, validate these in the American population such that we can use them to support regulatory and payer decisions I think that would be valuable, um, some of this additional research to look at where we're going next in order to, to improve our decision-making skills. I like that validation. That makes perfect sense. Um, we're very close to the end of the hour, but uh, Megan Patterson, I know that uh, some questions had come from the audience. Um, it, are there questions that, um, that we didn't come to that you wanted to bring to the group? 
Yeah, there was a question actually about the level of interest in getting objective um, activity uh, data and functional status data. And it sounds like, you know, six minute walk being a great example, um, or even just passive data. And it sounds like that is of, of interest to, to most stakeholders, including um, the FDA, as Misty was just um, mentioning. But I do, I want to move to um, a question here about how, uh, how uh, consistently or how frequently are patient reported you know, recognizing the challenges in operationalizing um, patient reported outcome measures. How often in vascular are you seeing um, those outcome measures being used in decision making, even without that validation? Mm, that, that's in, that's interesting because you know we typically we we typically collect patient outcomes up front, and then we may collect the same thing down the road, but it's typically used in my experience descriptively, not to make a definitive decision one way or the other. And I think some of the flavor I'm getting from the group is we need to find ways to elevate those. Uh, and one great example was given by Joe Carroll, and I think Alejandro echoed it with respect to cancer treatments or treating people that have these very aggressive diseases and whether they're really up for an aggressive uh, treatment or not. That's one way that these could be used up front. I don't know, does anybody, anyone want to add anything to what I mentioned? So yeah, good. I would okay. love to know from the, from the, um, from Dr. Mullen and, and Buckley, um, in terms of, uh, I, I would just be curious to know how often you're actually seeing patient reported outcome measures for um, in the vascular space. And what level of, you know, is it complementary? Is are they actually, you know, secondary outcomes, those kinds of things? We are seeing them more often, particularly as secondary outcomes, but the trials that have been completed use the typical ones that Donna previous mentioned, the um, uh, EQ5D and the SF36 and the walking impairment questionnaire. So, but um, our, our trials that are ongoing now, we're starting to see additional um, quality of life measures, such as the Venus study using um, veins or other measures. So I'm hoping in the arterial space, we may see more of these also, especially as uh, different patient populations are being treated as we move into the CLI space, CLTI, we may see more quality of life measures uh, with higher eleva elevated importance um in this particular patient population whereas where we have been in more of the uh upper limb or even um carotid space more is known there so we're less likely to see the quality of life measures very good well i think we're at the we're very close we're actually two minutes after the top of the hour um i would like to uh thank the panel i've honestly i've learned a great deal over this past hour I'd like to thank Dr. Buckley, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Jaff, Dr. Malone, and Dr. Hyatt, and uh, just remind the whole group that this is um, a discussion that's actually, um, it's been ongoing, and this is yet another edition, and as I said, in September, we're going to have an innovation summit where we take some of these ideas and move them further, so we're so pleased you're able to spend the time. Uh, Megan, any closing comments? No, just that we're, we're very grateful to have, um, you know, our panelists join us today and discuss this, this topic. And we're looking forward, you know, as an organization to better understanding how we can, you know, move the needle in terms of advancing the use of patient reported outcomes. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking thank time you. out of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.